Right, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Ramon Acedo. I'm the product manager for a few things in the OpenStack team. And today we're gonna talk about OpenShift on OpenStack and a few more things. But let's start with um, OpenShift and you know how OpenShift runs on different platforms, as you know, uh, one of them being OpenStack, which is the one we're interested in. But OpenShift runs on Amazon Web Services. It runs on plain bare metal. Right? It runs also on uh, virtualization platforms, such as Ref. In particular, today we're interested in OpenShift on OpenStack. OpenShift in this context is uh, consuming uh, resources exposed by OpenStack. Right? We all know the resources that OpenStack exposes, and it's an abstraction layer for the data center that uh, will abstract the network, the storage, the compute, and OpenShift needs a way to consume all of this ideally transparently for the end user, right? Um, the end user of OpenShift, by the way, is uh, a developer, right? And as a developer, what they are doing is, uh, well, um, developing applications, regardless of the underlying infrastructure that you have with them, right? So that's why we say it's workload driven. OpenStack is workload driven. And, uh, sorry, OpenShift is workload driven. If I'm a developer, I don't really care whether below I have OpenStack, Amazon Web Services, I care about my applications, about my workloads. But then what we need is something that makes it transparent for this end user, right? And this, we can achieve it with a deep integration between the two products. So um, when you have contextual awareness, when OpenShift knows by uh, uh, something that's actually called the uh, cloud provider for OpenStack, that's part of Kubernetes. As you know, OpenShift uh, runs with Kubernetes. Um, this provider needs to understand how to talk to OpenStack, right? So um, how do we do this? Well, uh, you need to make it aware of uh, Neutron and how to interact with Neutron, Cinda, how to interact with Cinder, um, et cetera, right? Anything that's going to be relevant for running these containers on top of OpenStack, like if I'm a developer and I say, um, hey, I want 10 more instances of this uh, container, right? I don't care how you do it, but just do that for me. Or um, I want to present uh, block devices to these applications that are running on um, containers. So with the cloud provider, uh, we need a way to do that. And that's part of the uh, integration that uh, these two products have, right? What else? Well, OpenStack itself um, is a platform that scales very well. Um, it's 100% API driven, and that makes it so much easier when we run OpenShift on, on top of OpenStack, right? Um, we can programmatically uh, work on the escalation of uh, resources, be it uh, storage, network, or compute, right? What else? Well, um, having OpenStack as a platform for running containers on top with OpenShift is really um, a way of leveraging everything that we have put on OpenStack for years, right? Imagine an example, Cinda. Cinda interacts with loads of uh, different storage backends, right? Over the years, we have been developing support for, uh, you name it, Ceph, uh, NetApp, uh, EMC, storage arrays. Well, we don't need to do all of this all over again, right? So this abstraction layer that OpenStack provides us is really useful for, for OpenShift because it's, again, a transparent way for us to have access to everything that the data center um, has, including, by the way, switches, right? Um, if you think about uh, Ironic, and we'll touch on Ironic a little bit today, and uh, if you think about, uh, well, uh, I want multi-tenancy with bare metal, um, this is something that you can do with uh, OpenStack as well through ML2 drivers, right? Uh, configuring the switches with the VLANs that uh, your tenants and our tenant is OpenShift in this case uh, require, okay? Um, on top of that, well, in, in this slide, which is high level, by the way, this presentation is going to be more or less high level. Maybe we'll touch a little bit on uh, some technical details, but um, I hope that after this presentation you understand the why we are doing this and, and some of the how, and also the plans that we have with all of this. 
And um, if you think about the management of this, well, uh, there are a number of um, products that you can use uh, to have a simplified visibility of the two platforms that concern to us uh, here, OpenShift and OpenStack. Um, Manage IQ or Cloud Forms, uh, it's another open source tool that uh, you can use to have visibility of uh, OpenShift, OpenStack, and other um, providers, I think they are called, in Manage IQ that uh, you will see them in a single pane of glass, as many people like to say, right? And all of this on top of RHEL. And RHEL doesn't really require any presentation, right? It's, it's a solid foundation for all this stack that we built, and uh, it helps us with many things, but uh, in a nutshell, probably with uh, stability and a, and a trusted platform for everything that runs on top. Right, well, let's uh, set the context uh, for what we are doing here. Remember, we are installing OpenShift on top of OpenStack, seamlessly, in an easy way, as much as possible. And for that, I'd like to talk about Triple O, right? Triple O, well, involves two clouds. We have the other cloud, which you can think about it as a, an installer, and you have the over cloud, the OpenStack platform that we'll use, the OpenStack platform that well, it's uh, compatible with all the applications that we'll be working with for uh, integration with the APIs, etc. Well, and the under cloud as well, by the way. The under cloud is OpenStack. It's, uh, a number, it's an all-in-one OpenStack deployment. You can think of it uh, in that way, right? You do OpenStack under cloud install, and by the end of this uh, installer, you have OpenStack with Neutron, with Nova, right? With Ironic. That's important as well, because obviously we want to deploy the infrastructure on top of, uh, on, on bare metal directly. And this is what the under cloud is good at, right? At deploying OpenStack on bare metal. And more things, not only OpenStack. Let's see how the flow um, is with, with Triple O. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Triple O, but let's review this uh, real quick. So you have new hardware, racked, wired, and what do you do? Well, now I want to use this hardware for my OpenStack deployment. Okay, so first we identify one machine. That machine will be director. Every time I say director, it's triple O, right? Uh, so we have triple O installed on this machine. And after that, what we uh, do is, okay, uh, now I want you, director, to be aware of all this hardware that I have. So I register this hardware with you. What am I doing with that? Well, I'm telling uh, director, I'm telling Ironic in reality, right? Ironic register the nodes, and after that, the nodes are ready to be inspected. What does that mean? Well, the inspection goes through the specs uh, of, of the nodes. It extracts everything in a readable way. It's JSON, so yes, it's readable, and stores it for us or for automations uh, to make decisions based on uh, different specs of the hardware if we want to. Okay, so then I need to define the network. Uh, I need to say via templates, hey, I'm gonna use the NICs in this way. I'm going to use these networks. I'm going to use these subnets. I'm going to use these routers. So you type that in, in your templates, and uh, then you say, well, and I want this node to be a controller. Usually you will pick three nodes as controller, maybe more, right, because you want a highly available uh, control plane for your open stack. The controllers are where, uh, well, the APIs will be running, among other things. And then you will identify other nodes in your data center that will be, well, uh, what we call the over cloud nodes, so your actual open stack for your tenants, right? So we do this, we let it install everything, it will go and validate that uh, everything is as it should be. And if uh, it finds that something is not, it will let you know. So yeah, you can uh, figure it out and, and, and fix it for it to work. And after that, you have an over cloud up and running. And not only that, it's, it's highly available, right? If you want to put this in production, there's no question that you're gonna do this. And uh, you can scale it out, right? And you will keep doing that. So the first year you will have a, uh, a couple of racks maybe, then after a while you realize that you need more racks, so you tell director about it, and director will do this part of the life cycle, okay? Okay, so this was to set the context of director as a OpenStack instance, because that's what it is, deploying OpenStack, right? Good, what else? Well, uh, let me talk about the OpenShift Ansible installer. 
So the OpenShift Ansible installer, uh, you have a link here to the um, GitHub repository, is, is the official installer for OpenShift, right? And it has, uh, well, support for installing on top of OpenStack, right? If you go here, you will see all the details and, well, we're putting a lot of work on making it uh, work with every component that uh, we want it to work with. And actually, it's made a lot of progress. Uh, pay attention to this because uh, we're going to see um, very cool you know, changes uh, in, in the installer. Um, how does it do it? Well, it's based on Ansible. So it's a set of Ansible playbooks. And uh, well, you will see that um, it will help you configuring OpenStack. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, it will configure Cinda, uh, how many volumes do you want, how do, do you want, how do you want them, uh, where do you want them to pre be presented, uh, what the, say, topology of your OpenShift infrastructure, right? How many master nodes, how many infrastructure nodes, uh, how do they look like, where do they go, etc. So you put all that logic inside the installer. It will help you with uh, configuring the DNS, uh, Courier, we'll touch on Courier uh, today a little bit. Um, you will tell OpenShift Ansible, hey, I now want to use uh, Courier because I know it's uh, supported now. It's part of um, OpenStack and it's how I want my containers to uh, communicate with the rest of the OpenStack infrastructure, mainly with uh, VMs and other containers. Okay? The same goes for Cinder, etc. Okay, so this OpenShift Ansible, uh, a tool to bear in mind. Uh, you see, I also like to mention OpenShift Ansible because I've seen so many times people uh, writing their own Ansible playbooks to do the same, okay? And while this is a great exercise, if we all contribute to the same project, uh, which is this one that I just showed you, um, I think things will be on the long term uh, much, much better, right? It's great to do the exercise of, okay, what do I need to do with Ansible to deploy OpenShift on OpenStack? But understanding how this works, which is pretty simple, and uh, contributing to it is even better, right? We grow when we share, we say. Um, okay, now, as part of setting the context, uh, bare metal. Let's talk about Ironic for a, for a second. Um, Ironic, I'm sure, it doesn't require a presentation, but uh, well, it's an enterprise-ready bare metal service, or bare metal as a service, right? Um, it's been many years since Ironic is around, uh, so we've been polishing it little by little. Um, this week there are a few presentations about Ironic, a project update. Um, if you're interested, make sure you, you attend. Uh, we have great plans uh, with Ironic. And uh, as you know, Ironic is integrated with Neutron. Uh, remember what I mentioned earlier about the ML2 uh, drivers that are capable of configuring switches, right? This is part of the integration with Neutron and this is important in, in, in many um, scenarios. For example, with OpenShift as well, right? Um, it's integrated with Nova, obviously, uh, and with Cinder. We, we've been working on the integration with Cinder for um, boot from Cinder volumes, right? We cannot connect, uh, well, we cannot connect Cinda volumes directly to a provisioned uh, bare metal node. Um, maybe we can. Uh, there is a project called Standalone Cinder, uh, which is part of our roadmap as well, integrating this in um, Ironic. But uh, it can boot from them, okay? So this is Ironic. This slide is like this on purpose. It's not meant for me to go uh, point by point. But it's um, for you to read offline and uh, for you to compare Ironic with any other bare metal provisioning system, right? There are many bare metal provisioning systems out there. There is, uh, I don't know, Cobbler, um, many of them that just, you know, do that, deploy an image on a, a server or help you with uh, via kickstart or pre-seed, etc. But Ironic is way more than that, right? Ironic actually, uh, wants to be, and is almost there, uh, as, as VMs with Nova are for bare metal nodes, right? So we want an on-par experience with these two uh, services, right? We want to treat bare metal nodes just like you treat virtual instances. And I think we are very close to, to that, okay? We also need to understand that uh, through Ionic and OpenStack, we manage the life cycle of these bare metal nodes. So it's way more than 
um, a simple bare metal provisioning tool, right? We need to understand that. And, and that's why we pick this to do OpenShift on a private cloud platform, which is OpenStack, right? We need something solid and, um, and futureful, future rich, such as uh, Ironic, okay? Cool. Well, okay. Then how does OpenShift Ansible do that? Well, simple, right? Uh, we said that uh, it's one, OpenStack is 100 uh, API driven, 100%, and uh, OpenShift Ansible needs to understand how to talk to um, Ironic ultimately through the API. So if I'm OpenShift Ansible, if I'm this set of playbooks, I will say, hey, create these virtual instances for me uh, because I'm going to run in them the infrastructure nodes. Cool. All right. Now create the networks that I'm going to use with these instances uh, because I will need them uh, depending on how I do it. I will want more or less networks. So that for me, please. And then uh, create a number of physical instances because what I'm going to do is I will distribute my infrastructure, my OpenShift infrastructure between virtual and physical uh, nodes, right? Provided by OpenStack between Nova with uh, compute on KVM and Ironic, okay? And this is important. Um, usually, you know, it's pretty safe to run your infrastructure on uh, virtual instances, no problem with that. But uh, what really makes the difference is when it comes to the uh, containers, with the applications running on containers, when you want to have the maximum performance, uh, the maximum consolidation ratio of containers per, per node, and there is where Ironic comes in. There is where you want to have uh, containers running on bare metal, right? This is uh, a key point, uh, and, and this is one of the main drivers why we are doing this, to allow containers to run smoothly on um, bare metal, okay? Cool. Um, let's have a, a deeper dive, not very deep, but a deeper dive, how this looks like. So here we can see the typical um, deployment of OpenStack with OpenShift on top. So you start with the data center, with the servers in the data center, the switches, etc., And on top, you have um, your storage, your network, and your compute all abstracted by OpenStack, right? And OpenStack has, uh, well, for compute, two abstraction layers, one via uh, VMs, and another one directly getting access to the metal, getting access to bare metal nodes, right? On top of that is where we are going to put OpenShift. And we will distribute OpenShift in, uh, as I said before, uh, across VMs and bare metal nodes. Okay. Um, what else can we do with this? Right, so we have this, uh, we probably want to put this in production, so we have a management layer, and this management layer will have uh, multiple components that we may be interested in. For example, as I said, with Manage IQ, with Cloud Forms, single plane of glass, me as an operator, go there, and have um, visibility of the two uh, products working together in this case, right? And I can do operations. I can automate uh, workflows in there. Maybe I'm always doing the same operation, whichever that is, and I want a button that uh, when I click it, it does this operation that uh, consists on a number of API calls, for example, right? So I can implement all that logic in there. Um, director, if you think about it, uh, O is part of this uh, management uh, layer. So director will be the life cycle manager of OpenStack. So it will help me to add more nodes or uh, reduce the number of nodes that I have or help me with the upgrades, right? So it is, it is a key piece of our uh, management layer, actually. And then Ansible. Uh, Ansible, well, another product that doesn't really require any presentation. We'll Love Ansible because it makes us feel smart, right? In the morning, I can uh, write so many Ansible playbooks and I'm think, thinking that I'm, I'm so good at it. Well, uh, I'm good at it because they were better than I at uh, making it easy for us, right? Um, unlike maybe other platforms, which are super cool, but I don't know. I'm sure we all understand what I'm saying when uh, it comes to how easy it is to use uh, Ansible, right? Okay, and, and some other tools. Um, I mentioned here satellite. Uh, do you know what satellite uh, does? Well, it does many things. Um, one of them, for example, is, well, I can have my repositories for updates and everything offline in my satellite server. 
and then decide what do I want to upgrade, what do I not want to upgrade, etc., and put that logic on a satellite. Okay, now let's talk about the network between OpenShift and OpenStack, and that's um, now managed with Courier. So OpenStack, by default, as you know, with OpenBSwitch, uses VXLAN tunnels to have the VMs communicating between them, right? So no news there, it's a great uh, way of working, transparent for us, and it's done the job for a number of years now. Okay, so how does it, uh, how is this done with Kubernetes? Well, it turns out it's, it's very similar, right? It's used, uh, VXLAN is used with uh, Kubernetes as well, and uh, it works very well. Okay, so what happens when you put OpenShift on top of OpenStack? Well, if you have VMs having containers in them, uh, these containers will want to go through the VXLAN tunnel to talk to other containers. But if you are on a VM that in turn is connected via VXLAN tunnels to other VMs, all of a sudden you have uh, a tunnel inside of a tunnel going, you know, uh, back and forth, communicating. The, and uh, that sounds like, okay, I'm sure there will be a performance penalty in there, right? Uh, how much? Well, it depends on many variables. But hey, if we can just take this uh, out, this double encapsulation and say, hey, I'm going to tell Neutron that I'm a container and I want Neutron to kind of reroute me instead of uh, having my tunnel through its tunnel, I want Neutron to say, ah, no, no, you are a container. Okay, cool. So let's move you directly to the tunnel and then on the other end of the tunnel, you'll reach your other container that you want to talk to. Okay, so that's pretty much what Courier does. Uh, it's way more complex than that inside, but to us as operators, this is what we need to know. It's a way of uh, improving the performance and, you know, it's, it's um, something that uh, we all wanted to do uh, to remove this double encapsulation. Basically because uh, people have been trying this and have been reporting, hey, yeah, I tried it. Um, I think I'm going to wait until um, there is something that allows me with uh, this overlay, with this double encapsulation. So here we go. We have it now, right? An important piece that's been released with, uh, if you use uh, OSP, it's been released with uh, OSP 13, with our Queen's uh, release of OpenStack, okay? And Ironic, I already presented Ironic, probably we don't need to stop much uh, talking about it, but it's an important one. Um, notice that I say Ironic and Bare Metal as a Service. When I mention Bare Metal as a Service, um, it implies many things, but it implies many of the things that I wrote in that slide with um, small letters, right? Um, one of them, and again, it's uh, important, the network, ML2 plugins that are capable of configuring the physical switches, right? When you have that, you have a cloud with bare metal and multi-tenancy at the same time. When you don't have this level of multi-tenancy where you can have a pool of bare metal nodes shared by different tenants, that don't necessarily trust each other, um, you need these ML2 plugins capable of configuring the switches, the switches for you, okay? So this is more or less the idea behind uh, bare metal as a service, right? Which goes um, along with what I said that we want Ironic or the experience with Ironic to be the same as what we do with virtual instances on OpenStack. Awesome, okay, let's review a little bit, you know, the um, uh, infrastructure, the topology of this uh, combination. So the boxes in the middle represent um, OpenStack instances, right? Let's say that they are virtual instances for now. Um, the OpenShift, in, the uh, OpenShift Ansible installer uh, has the logic in it to say, okay, uh, I want this load balancer there, it'll be Octavia. I want uh, three master nodes, I want uh, three infrastructure nodes, and I will want three application nodes. Okay, cool. And what do I need to do? Um, uh, well, I will need to present uh, Cinda volumes to them, right? Um, OpenShift itself, the infrastructure, also works with containers, with pods. So all these components are uh, containerized as well. So 
then I will want Cinda to present to these pods um, block devices for them to store the persistent data, right? So all of these that you are seeing are OpenStack resources, right? This is the, the um, integration that we were talking about. The networks that you see here, we only have one, two, three networks. They will be OpenStack uh, networks as well, right? So it is really uh, deeply integrated. Okay. And um, OpenShift on OpenStack roadmap. Let's uh, talk about the ideas that uh, we have for uh, this. Starting by um, Queens or OSP13 uh, as we package it uh, at Red Hat. Uh, in Queens, uh, and by the way, um, OpenShift Ansible is uh, part of OpenShift, not of OpenStack, right? And uh, OpenShift has its own release cycle as well. And uh, well, it, it, we are releasing a version of OpenShift uh, that has support for everything that I said, for example, for creating all the resources, right? You just specify them in the playbooks and then uh, they get created. And um, what I'm saying is you don't need to wait until uh, OSP 13 is released. You can go and pick the current version of uh, OpenShift Ansible, right? <laughs> Um, what else? Well, Courier. As I said, uh, this is the first release where Courier is part of OpenStack. We are really excited about it. This is uh, something that uh, we believe it's going to have a, an exponential growth because uh, the feedback that we've been having is, okay, once Courier is in place, working and supported, uh, is where, when we are going to start uh, trying this. And this is coming now with Queens. And Octavia load balancing as well. So uh, as part of this integration, as I said, we want to use the OpenStack resources um, that we have at hand. One of them is Octavia. That's going to be part of, uh, is part of Queens. And in this context, this is an important piece as well. But what we are doing beyond that? Okay. I mentioned before a few times uh, how important bare metal is. And this is the feedback that we are having from customers, vendors, um, people who are fans of uh, containers. We want bare metal support. Okay, bare metal support is there, right? Uh, you can install containers on bare metal, no problem about that. But as I said, what we want with bare metal is an experience that's the same that you have with virtual machines, okay? So I want with bare metal to be able to present um, seeing the volumes as um, persistent volumes in OpenShift, okay? So you'll get that. Uh, I want with bare metal to install uh, the um, container application workloads and maybe the infrastructure uh, nodes as well or combine them, you know, transparently without me having to do special things about it. Okay, so we're putting all that logic in OpenShift Ansible. So OpenShift Ansible, will know that uh, that's bare metal and uh, I need to configure containers and the infrastructure in the bare metal nodes in a particular way. But the user is not really interested in what way. The user is really interested in uh, having the containers on bare metal, okay? Um, we're also expanding the um, storage integration. What's that, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know that OpenShift, Kubernetes in general, uh, works with a registry. Uh, we currently have a registry based on, on Cinder, and that works uh, beautifully. But uh, why not? Uh, it's, it's a good practice as well to have the registry in uh, object storage. And we have Ceph as well, and Ceph has Rados Gateway. So why not uh, having uh, our registry based on object storage uh, backed by Ceph? So this is another important piece of integration that we are working on. And the other one I mentioned uh, before, which is um, standalone Cinder. Standalone Cinder is, uh, well, it's a piece of software that basically knows where Cinder is. And without you uh, having uh, to install a full blown OpenStack, in this case we will, um, you will be able to present volumes to your uh, containers that are running on bare metal thanks to Cinder uh, standalone, okay? So this is another important piece. And well, we are working as well on making this very easy for the operator to scale, uh, scale out, scale back in maybe, um, 
very, have a way to very, in a very simple way, replace a node as part of a maintenance, for example. And we want to put that logic in uh, the Ansible uh, templates that are part of uh, OpenShift Ansible. Okay. So, um, well, if you're familiar with Ansible, I'm sure you understand why. But um, this is what we are implementing in there. Uh, it's a simple way. Go to your playbook, change the variables in it, run the template again, uh, run the um, playbook again, and off you go. And we are, well, actually we have many, many ideas, uh, more ideas and time to implement all of them usually, but uh, one of them as well is uh, integrating it with Manila, right? I've been talking about expanding the storage integration, that's part of uh, the storage integration as well. Uh, one of the good things that Manila has is uh, the, the persistent volumes in OpenShift can be uh, read and uh, written by, uh, well, one container at a time or by multiple containers at a time, right? When you have multiple containers at the same time writing on the same uh, persistent volume, well, uh, you need special type of uh, support on the um, back end. And Manila, uh, which, runs, which can run with uh, CFFS, will support that, right? Will support that level of parallel uh, reads and writes, right? RWX is called in the context of uh, Kubernetes. So that will help us with that particular use case. And uh, well, a dream would be having proper auto scaling. And uh, we're working on that. Actually, there is many, pe many people are working on auto scaling. We want OpenShift to be able to use OpenStack to auto scale automatically, right? Uh, or, or, yeah, or semi-automatically, depending on the operator and uh, what uh, everyone is comfortable with, right? But uh, since OpenShift can uh, or, or knows when it's maybe too loaded, right? With CPUs, memory, et cetera. And OpenShift, thanks to the cloud provider for OpenStack, that's part of OpenShift, that's part of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, well, through that, you can say, hey, uh, I need to expand, uh, I need to add more containers in here, right? So I tell the cloud provider, hey, do that for me. How? I don't care, you know? You know how to talk to OpenStack, so go ahead and uh, create me more VMs or maybe more bare metal nodes, right? So all this logic is being um, implemented as well. And another resource that we have with OpenStack that I'm sure you know, Designate, TNS as a service. Um, OpenShift relies on name resolution for, well, communicating the containers internally between, between them and also externally, right? So if we have a way for doing this, yeah, transparently, I could say, because um, uh, up until now, what you do is, uh, well, there is bind. I just, uh, and actually OpenShift uh, Ansible has support for that. Configure bind, let me update bind uh, whenever it's uh, required with a key, etc., cetera, and, uh, and I'll do it. Okay, but that same behavior can be done with uh, DNS as a service. So that will make the experience even more transparent in this case for the operator. Okay. And lastly, um, I wanted to mention that uh, there is a special interest uh, group for OpenShift on OpenStack. Um, it was briefly mentioned, if you remember, this morning in the, in the keynotes. Uh, if you go there you can, to this uh, URL, you can subscribe uh, to the mailing list and have all the uh, latest information about it. Otherwise, if you want to have a look at uh, the paper, uh, I think there was a link this morning in the keynotes, but it's something like openstack.org slash containers slash white paper, and you will see many of the ideas um, for running containers on top of OpenStack there as well. And with that, I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Good one um, regarding the um, ironic versus VM backend for um, OpenShift and OpenStack. Mm -hmm. Given that instances are sort of booted in the same way, why do we need special support for running on bare metal as opposed to running mm -hmm. in VMs? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so uh, if you want to have the same management with uh, VMs and ironic, you will use Nova, right? With Nova, uh, you will be able to say, start a server, right, you have flavor, 
and that flavor is associated to um, uh, bare metal nodes instead of bare, uh, virtual machines, and you are good. Uh, NOVA will abstract that for you. But when you need to do things like what I said, presenting physical uh, volumes coming from Cinda, uh, well, you will need Cinda standalone. This is just an example of something specific that you don't need in the virtual machines. Um, around storage, there are a few things like that. Um, and there are others that are beyond my knowledge, but uh, we need to um, um, make sure that it's transparent uh, and whatever Nova is not able to make transparent for us, we need to put the logic in what we are doing. So those are the reasons. Sure. Hello, Ramon. Hi. Um, any of this is actually uh, in production support by Red Hat? Is officially supported? Yes. So um, as I said in the roadmap, um, Red Hat is uh, releasing OSP 13 based on Queens. And uh, everything that was in the OSP 13 uh, slide is, uh, is going to be supported. The most important bit, I would say, it's Courier. Um, hi. Hi. Um, just uh, one question. Uh, you talk about Manila yeah. for uh, simultaneous uh, sharing uh, for storage. That's but uh, what will we need to use uh, a Cinder block volume instead of a file share? Because in production, uh, sometimes we might prefer to use a, a share volume. Mm -hmm. So uh, up until now, the provider, the OpenStack provider, has support for Cinder. So we, we have no other option, uh, just Cinder. Um, Cinder won't allow us to have these multiple read and writes by uh, containers, by multiple containers, right? And uh, if we implement support uh, with Manila, Manila has uh, CFFS, for example. Manila is based on uh, file systems, right? Uh, it's an abstraction layer for that. Shared file systems will be able to do that because that layer will allow us uh, to you know, have multiple uh, containers uh, writing and reading on the same uh, persistent volume. OK, just, but are you planning to move later to block storage, or you plan just to stay on, on the no. FFS? Block storage yeah. is already implemented. Right, but multi-node sharing. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what uh, Manila will, as soon as the provider, as soon as the uh, Kubernetes OpenStack provider, cloud provider, has support for Manila, will have uh, automatically support for uh, multiple reads and writes. Currently, we, uh, we can't do that directly with, uh, with Cinda. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, what function is Octavia going to provide? Is it just an external load balancer, or will it be participating in like a service mesh at all? Or oh, okay. So Octavia is, uh, as you know, is, is load balancing as a service, and uh, as part of what you need to do with um, containers when you want to have a single point of entry to your application, but backed by multiple instances, multiple containers, you will need a load balancer, right? You will need a level of routing. So there is where uh, Octavia can help OpenShift. So it's going to be north-south communication? It's north-south communication. And I'm not sure I can answer the question whether it's also east-west. Uh, that's beyond my knowledge right now. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I have a question about Courier. Do you have any metrics on how much performance you actually saw because of double encapsulation? Because it has its own complexity in Korea, right? I mean, that's, what exactly is the metric that you... That's a very good question that we have a performance and a scaling team working on as we speak. Uh, because, you know, we wanted to see the numbers. And your question is a question that I have myself. And uh, I want, uh, you know, a, a more specific answer to be able to say, OK, on average, it's going to be 50%, 60%. So what we are planning is uh, with uh, Queens run uh, well, a large scale uh, deployment without Courier, measure it, and then another one uh, with Courier, measure it to be able to compare apples to apples, you know, to be on the same context. We have data from previous um, um, performance and scale tests without Courier, and that's okay, but um, sometimes it's not fair to compare to old uh, or, or different setup because it's not exactly the same. 
uh, when we were on Newton as uh, with Queens now. So we are working on that and uh, we'll, we'll publish um, some of the results. But, but the question is a little bit, uh, I mean, related to that, that you would do that first and then do Korea, right? Because what if the performance is like 5%? I don't know, I'm just... Yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't know either the exact uh, numbers. But uh, once, once we have the two tests, okay. we'll be able to say exactly what the uh, improvement in performance is. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, we don't have it right now. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, I just want to add here, I think it's not only about um, how much more performance you gain when you don't double encapsulate, because I think it will be not so much, to be honest. Um, but um, it's more about when you have OpenShift and OpenStack, they are both SDN providers. So you have an SDN provider running in an SDN provider. You have no interaction of those two SDN providers, and you need um, something like um, um, external networks to make use of virtual machines and um, 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 OpenShift um, pods to um, communicate together. So it's more a problem of how communication runs and how you can rid of, get rid of those double SDN providers That's more right. than about, I think the performance thing is not the real... Uh, it's, it's important because we care about performance, but uh, the implementation, sure. as you say, uh, wasn't you know, a good one. And, and now we have the proper implementation. Yeah. Um, we don't have time for more questions. Uh, the next speakers are uh, coming in. So thanks, everyone, for attending. <laughs> <laughs>